Good afternoon. Imagine this, two sisters at an apartment door looking for their little sister. They've called and called. Others have gone by and knocked. They just can't seem to find Angie. She hasn't called. She hasn't shown up at her sister Monica's house like she usually does. She goes every morning to watch Monica's kids. Nobody's heard from her. Fearing that something has happened, Monica takes the spare key that she has to her little sister's apartment and she goes there with her other sister, Ashley. The door is closed, the door is locked. She takes that key, puts it into the lock, turns the handle, and steps inside. She sees her sister, her little sister, Angie, laying on the floor in the living room, covered by a blanket. She walks into the apartment, walks up to her sister, and pulls back that blanket. What does she see? She sees a sight that she should never have to, a sight that no sister should have to see, that none of us should have to see. She sees a young woman, her little sister, a girl in her teens, bloody, stiff, and swollen in death on the floor. She's beaten so badly that she's hardly recognizable. Her skull crushed, her lifeless body on the living room floor. She's laying there in a pool of dried blood with blood on her face, her own blood, and she's covered by a blanket. Law enforcement learns that this young woman is Angie Zapata. She's 18 years old and at the beginning of her life, or so it seemed. Angie's sisters, Monica and Ashley, they stumbled onto a gruesome scene that day. Her mother, brother, and her other sisters, they had to receive that dreaded phone call, the call that no one wants to get, the call that every parent, sibling, every person dreads, the one saying that someone they loved is dead. Angie's body was found on July 17th, 2008 in her tiny one-bedroom apartment here in Greeley that she was renting. If you saw Angie before this day, you would have seen a young, vibrant 18-year-old. But she wasn't an ordinary woman, and you all know this by now. Angie was born male, and she was named Justin. However, since the time that she was very small, she believed that she was a woman. Some say from the age as early as seven, some even before, that she started to conform to typical female stereotypes. It took time and patience for all of Angie's friends and family to see who Angie truly was. But everybody finally did, and at some point, they started to call her Angie. By the time that this occurred, this murder, she had already been living as a woman for quite some time. Angie's short life ended that day, suddenly, and it was all at the hands of the defendant, Alan Ray Andrade. The defendant met Angie only a few days before. They met a way people often do nowadays, through a social networking site. We can't tell you much about what they said and what messages were exchanged on that site, because the defendant erased everything from his account after this murder. The defendant lived in Thornton. He came to Greeley to meet and to spend time with Angie. He was living with a woman there, his ex-girlfriend. He didn't tell her and he didn't tell his current girlfriend what he was coming to Greeley for or who he was going to be with. Angie and the defendant met in Thornton. She gave him a ride back to Greeley. They spent the entire day or the rest of the day together on July 16th and those next two days together as well. That second day, that was the 15th of July, Angie had court. She had a traffic ticket that she needed to deal with in municipal court here in Greeley. It was something that she didn't want to do by herself and she wanted someone to go with her. She told friends and family members that she was picking up a guy to take with her to court because she didn't want to go alone. 
Now, Angie's normal job was to take care of her sister Monica's kids. And after court that day, when the defendant went with her to Greeley Municipal Court, she dropped him back off at her apartment and she went to her sister's to do her job. The evidence would suggest to you that Angie trusted the defendant enough to leave him in her apartment that day by himself. She returned later that evening, and the next day she got up and went to work again. That next day was the last day of Angie Zapata's life. She went to work for her sister Monica, returned home at about six or seven, and a short time later, her and the defendant left and went and got some alcohol. It was that night, after returning back to the apartment, that the defendant picked up a fire extinguisher and he struck her repeatedly in the head, crushing her skull until she was bloody and she lay dead on the floor. The defendant then took items from the house, took Angie's sister's car that she was driving, and he fled the scene. He drove away and he drove off to live his own life. The gruesome scene, the evidence, and the defendant's own statements will reveal to you that the defendant's actions were done after deliberation and with the intent to kill Angie Zapata. Nobody deserves to die like this. No one deserves to discover what Monica and Ashley, her sisters, discovered on that day. No one deserves to get a phone call like her mother and her other family members did that day. On that day, July 16th, when the defendant chose to murder Angie Zapata, he felt justified in serving as judge, jury, and executioner over her. On that day, he felt that it was appropriate and right for him to take on the power of deciding whether Angie should live or whether Angie should die. What you're gonna know at the end of this case is that this was not a snap decision. The defendant knew for approximately 36 hours that Angie was biologically male. You'll see that as a trial unfolds, after time. Witnesses come, testify. They're all like puzzle pieces. And what your job is as jurors is to put the puzzle together. You're going to hear from different witnesses. You're going to see different evidence. And your job is to decide which picture is correct. I've just outlined for you the events as we believe they happened, at least in rough outline. There's going to be more details that you get throughout the trial from witnesses and evidence. And at the end of the trial, we're going to ask you to put those pieces together and tell us what picture it is that you find. We believe that the evidence in this case will specifically show that between July 12th and July 16th, there were almost 700 communications between the defendant and Angie Zapata. On Monday, July 14th, we believe the evidence will show that she borrowed her mother Maria's car. She told her family, told her friends, that she was going to Thornton to pick up a guy to take to court with her. The evidence will show you that on the 15th of July, at that court appearance in Greeley Municipal Court, the place that she usually went with her sisters or with her family, that she went with the defendant, this defendant. And she sat there in the courtroom as they called her case. City of Greeley versus Justin Zapata. You'll get to hear that. And you're going to get to hear that she was there with the man. And court clerks will remember this. They remember this because Angie always came in with women, her friends, her family. And the day that she showed up with a man, it turned into a little bit of office gossip. Everyone there knew that Angie was transgender. And they started wondering, who is this person? Who is this man? Is this her boyfriend? It was the defendant. On Wednesday, July 16th, we believe that the evidence will show you that Angie worked all day. She then went to visit a friend, had dinner, and came home. You'll get to see surveillance video of purchases at a liquor store with the defendant on that video. And the next day, 
on the 17th, we believe the evidence will show you that at, that is the day she was discovered, the scene that I described to you at the beginning, where her sisters came to the apartment, they walked in, and they found Angie brutally beaten and covered by a blanket. You'll also hear that there were some items taken from Angie's home, items that were missing when the police arrived. One of those was a fire extinguisher. It was missing from the hook there in the apartment on, in the, apartment on the wall. Also missing was the PT Cruiser of her sisters that she drove on a regular basis, as well as those keys to the PT Cruiser. Her cell phone, her purses, and also her sister Monica's credit card. You'll hear from a crime scene investigator who was there that day, on scene on the 17th, who'll tell you that what he also noticed while he was at the scene, besides all the observations of what was missing, was the fact that he believed the, clean, the scene was cleaned up. He'll tell you, for example, that he found white marks and water stains on bottles in the sink, on a bottle that was located elsewhere, like someone had washed those bottles and tried to get rid of any evidence that would have been on them. You'll hear from a forensic pathologist in this case. For those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it's like the coroner. He's the person who performed the autopsy on July 8th. I'm sorry, July 18th. What you'll hear from the forensic pathologist is the fact that he found that the victim was a victim of homicide. He found that the cause of death in this case was blunt force trauma. Blunt force trauma that was inflicted by multiple wounds. There were multiple injuries on Angie, bruising of her skull, bruising of her brain, crushing of her skull, you're also going to see that the injuries that were inflicted are not inconsistent with the fire extinguisher that was missing from her home. You'll find out that between July 17th and July 28th, there were multiple transactions at multiple locations on her sister Monica's credit card. Those happened all throughout the Denver metro area. Then on July 30th, the defendant was arrested. He was found in possession of the stolen PT Cruiser that belonged to Angie's sister and found in possession of Angie's sister's credit card, both of which he had been using for the past two weeks like they were his own. The defendant was in, arrested in Thornton, which is where he's from. Upon his arrest, he told the Thornton officers that he did steal the car. He told them, I found it with the keys in it and I just took it. It was at that point that Detective Tharp, our advisory witness, drove out to Thornton to meet with the defendant. He interviewed him there, and the defendant again confirmed that he stole the PT Cruiser. He said that he had taken it a week before. He also confirmed his use of the debit card on more than one occasion. During this interview, the defendant is not truthful about even knowing Angie Zapata. When he's shown a picture of her, he denies knowing who she is. When confronted with phone records documenting those almost 700 communications that I told you about, he states, oh, hell no. As Detective Tharp lays out the charges against the defendant, the defendant denies killing Angie. You'll also have an opportunity to hear some calls made by the defendant. These were calls made by him when he was in the jail after his arrest. On the night of his arrest, he called his girlfriend. And he told her, this was bad. It was a mistake. Totally, you know? But when it happened, it happened. Somebody, somebody died. And she said, did you kill somebody? And he said, I can't say that. We're on the phone. In a later call to his ex-girlfriend, he admits to wielding a fire extinguisher during the commission of this crime and bragging about how the other inmates are afraid of him because of it. You'll hear that the police recovered the keys to the PT Cruiser while they were there in Thornton, and on that key ring was the defendant's own apartment key. The police also recovered the victim's missing purses, those purses that were missing from Angie's home, not from the defendant, from the defendant's girlfriend, he gave them to her as gifts after he had killed Angie. You'll hear about DNA evidence that was analyzed in this case. DNA samples taken from the scene, 
DNA taken from those missing purses, and evidence collected from the body of the victim. The analysis of the evidence puts the defendant at the scene, it puts him in possession of those purses that we were just talking about, and it shows no evidence of Angie fighting back and absolutely no evidence of sexual activity occurring. You'll hear more calls made by the defendant after his arrest. You'll hear a call that he made to his girlfriend that demonstrates his hatred for homosexuals. Calls that will give you a window into the defendant's mind a window that will show you the defendant's bigotry, prejudice, and bias against homosexuals. You'll hear calls where the defendant says things like, gay fool, tell him I'll kill him too, pink shirt wearing motherfucker, don't you know I don't like that shit? Anyways, don't get me crazy. Another conversation where the defendant states, gay things <laughs> need to die and another conversation where it makes it clear that there is a difference between killing someone who's homosexual and someone who's not. He says, it's not like I went up to a school teacher and shot her in the head or killed a straight law-abiding citizen. The evidence in this case will show someone who abhors homosexuals, someone who knew for quite some time that Angie was transgender and he brutally killed her because of it. Just as important of, as what the evidence will show you is also what the evidence in this case won't show you. You heard about this a little bit in many. The evidence in this case will not show you any evidence of sexual activity occurring either at or near the time that this murder was committed. This is confirmed by the defendant's own statements that you're gonna hear on some of those calls statements that Angie made to others. What Angie was doing is she was possibly looking for a roommate. Perhaps it was the defendant who was looking for more. You're also not going to hear any evidence of any further communication between Angie and the defendant after July 16th. There will be no evidence that this decision was made in a snap. All the evidence indicates that the defendant knew that Angie was biologically male and that he decided to kill her because of it. There was the 36 hour window that he had to walk away. There were the calls and the texts. You'll hear evidence about how they dropped off towards the end. The court appearance where he was there with her by her side when she's called Justin Zapata and the tiny apartment that they shared for three days. All of this evidence together, as well as other, will show you that he knew that Angie was biologically male. A reasonable person in this situation, a person who was uncomfortable being with someone who is transgender, would have left the situation. But instead, the defendant, he decided to address the situation. And because of his decision, we're all here today. He stands charged with the vicious murder of Angie Zapata. Ladies and gentlemen, on July 17th, Angie Zapata, she was brutally beaten to death in her own apartment. She was bloody, stiff, and swollen on the floor. Her short life ended violently and suddenly that day, only a few days after she met the defendant and at his hands. This is the person who spent time with her, talked to her, and then on the evening of July 16th, picked up a fire extinguisher and bashed in her skull. His statements will prove to you that the reason that he did this was because she was transgender, and he didn't like that. At the end of this trial, we're going to return, and we're going to ask that you find the defendant guilty of murder, in the first degree, guilty of an intentional act of picking up that fire extinguisher, crushing in her skull after having known for 36 hours that she was biologically male. We're going to ask that this deed not go unpunished. Regardless of who Angie was, ladies and gentlemen, she didn't deserve to die like this. No one deserves to die like this. Find the defendant guilty of all counts.
Thank you. Mr. Martin, would you like to make an opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. This case is not about a judgment of a lifestyle. This case is not about whether Justin Zapata's lifestyle is right or wrong. This case is about a deception and the reaction to that deception. In July of 2008, Alan Andrade met a girl named Angie Zapata. <coughs> and they met on a dating site called Moco Space. And you're gonna hear that Angie Zapata's Moco Space profile, which is the, the thing that gives identifying characteristics of a person, was that of a straight female. Now on July 15th, Angie picked Alan up at Alan's house in Thornton and drove back to Angie's apartment in Greeley. Now once back at uh, Angie's apartment, Alan and Angie spent the night together. The next day, Angie goes off to work and leaves Alan at the apartment. And when she returns home from work, Alan and Angie have a conversation, at which point Alan discovers that Angie, this girl that he had met, this girl who he had just spent the last night with, was in fact a man. And Alan snapped. Alan flew into an uncontrollable rage, and he started hitting Justin, and he kept hitting him. <coughs> and when it was over, and Alan realized what had happened, he ran out of the apartment. Now, as you heard a moment ago, the prosecution has charged Alan Andrade, among other things, with first degree premeditated murder. Now, later on, the judge is going to inform you on the law that you have to follow here. But the prosecution must prove that Alan Andrade killed Justin Zapata intentionally after reflecting and judging on the act of killing him. And they must prove that this killing didn't occur in a hasty, or an impulsive manner. Now, as you heard before, you're going to hear phone calls over the next few days that Alan Andrade made from jail to Felicia Mendoza. And you're going to hear Alan describe this incident to Felicia. And as you saw a moment ago, you're going to hear Alan refer to this incident as a mistake. You're going to hear Alan say that when he found out that this person he thought was a female was actually a male, he snapped. You're going to hear him say that it happened so fast and so hard, I couldn't stop it. <clears throat> You're going to hear him say that it didn't even know what happened. You're going to hear him say that he didn't know how or why he reacted that way. <clears throat> You're going to hear him say that it was uncontrollable and that he was outside himself and that he wasn't acting as a coherent person. And you're going to hear that instead of trying to get away with this killing and just slipping out of Justin's apartment into the night, Alan takes Justin's car and drives all over Denver with it. And further, you're going to hear that Alan uses a credit card he found in that car at various stores throughout Denver and the surrounding areas. And in fact, you're going to hear that when Alan is arrested by Thornton police officers, he's actually sitting in that car. And he's blaring the music so loud that the neighbor's kids get woken up. And the neighbor actually calls the police because of this. But more importantly, you will hear no direct evidence that Alan killed Justin after an exercise of reflection and judgment. 
Now, the prosecution, among other things, has also charged this as a biased, motivated crime. Now, again, the judge is going to instruct you on the law that you have to follow here. But to convict under this charge, you need to be convinced that Allen knowingly caused bodily injury to Justin because of his actual or perceived uh, transgender status or sexual orientation, because of it. But the evidence in this case is going to show that Allen thought that Justin was Angie, that Allen thought he was a girl. The evidence is going to show that Allen had no idea until right before he started hitting Justin that this person he thought was a she was actually a he. Remember, Justin Zapata's MoCo space profile, the identifying characteristics of this person, was that of a female. It wasn't that of a transgendered person, and it certainly wasn't that of a man. You're also going to hear from witnesses throughout this trial that uh, knew Justin. You're also going to hear from witnesses throughout this trial that had seen Justin around the apartment complex. And these witnesses are going to tell you that Justin looked and acted like a female. They're going to tell you that everything about Justin's outward appearance was feminine. One of these witnesses that you're going to hear from is J.J. Alejandro. Now, J.J. Alejandro was a man who actually lived with Justin in the same apartment for two months. And you're going to hear J.J. tell you that he never saw Justin leave that apartment without makeup on. You're going to hear Justin say that during the two months that he lived with Justin, that J.J. actually went through Justin's closets and the only clothes in those closets were women's clothes. J.J. Alejandro is going to tell you that everything, from Justin's appearance to his mannerisms and even his speech, was that of a female. In fact, J.J. will tell you that when he was first introduced to Justin by his friend Mercedes Ponderelli, he thought that Justin was a girl. And that even after, when Mercedes Ponderelli told him that Angie is actually Justin, it's actually a man, you're going to hear JJ say he had to do a double take because he couldn't believe it. JJ is going to tell you that even Justin's apartment smelled like a female lived there. Now, as you heard a second ago, you're also going to hear uh, some jail phone calls that Alan made to Felicia Mendoza, where he says things like, gay things need to die. You're going to hear that. You're also going to hear Alan say some other things uh, in sort of a derogatory fashion using the word gay. But more importantly than what's said is you will hear the context at which these statements were made under. You're going to hear that both Alan and Felicia are laughing and joking during this whole thing. You need to keep in mind that during these phone calls, Alan is being held in custody on a bias-motivated crime charge that he knows he didn't commit. You're also going to hear Alan refer to Justin as an it. But you're also going to hear that almost every police officer that investigated this crime had trouble figuring out how to refer to Justin. And then, in fact, a lot of officers, in their own police reports, switched back and forth between referring to Justin as a he and referring to Justin as a she. It's confusing. Now, the prosecution is going to try to show you that Alan must have known that Angie was a man or a transgendered person prior to the killing. And you heard a second ago that, that they're going to try to show you that Justin had this municipal court hearing in Greeley on the morning of the 15th, and that Justin was accompanied by a male to that hearing. And they're going to bring in some municipal court clerks to testify to this, and you're going to hear their testimony. 
But what you're going to hear in their testimony is that none of these municipal court clerks, none of these people who are testifying that Justin was there that day with a man is going to point to Alan Andrade and say, that's the man that was there. None of them are going to say that to you. None of them are going to be able, able to identify for you who that male was that accompanied Justin to the courthouse. Again, this case isn't about a judgmental lifestyle. It's not about whether Justin Zapata's lifestyle is right or wrong. This case is about a deception and a reaction to that deception. Now, after you guys have heard all the evidence and after all the witnesses have stepped down from the witness stand, we ask you to return to that jury room, consider the evidence, and find Alan Andrade not guilty of first degree premeditated murder and not guilty of a bias motivated crime. Thank you. Thank you. Prosecution may call the first witness. And if you can please introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. My name is Marian Morales. It's M O R. A L E S. Thank you. you Make seven. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to ask a few questions. Do you? Did you? Um, where do you live now? I live in Denver. Okay. And did you ever live in Greeley? Yes. Okay. And where did you live when you lived in Greeley? I lived over here on 20, 25 Fourth Avenue, apartment five. 2025 Fourth Avenue, apartment five. Mm -hmm. And would you recognize a photo of those apartments if I showed them to you? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I'm handing the witness what I've previously shown defense counsel as people's number two, three, and four. Okay. Ms. Morales, if you just want to take a look at those photos and let me know if you recognize them. Yes, this is the place I was living in. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and are all three of those photos fair and accurate photos of where you used to live? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Your Honor, if, if photos two, three, and four could be admitted in evidence? No objection. Okay. People's two, three, four are received as evidence. You're welcome to publish. We can publish people's two. And if you look, there's a screen right there by you, and there's a screen up there. When you lived there, you said you lived in apartment number five? Yes. Okay. And can you see roughly where apartment number five is in that picture? Do you know where the white door is open? Right across from that. Okay. Your Honor, would it be all right if the witness stepped out? Sure. Point into the you know, there's, a, there's actually a little pointer. Wood pointer, thank you. Where the door is on, Andrew? Uh-huh. I live right across right there. Okay. Thank you. if we could publish people's three and is that a better view of it is it the apartment yes uh -huh. and is it the apartment upstairs on the left yes it is okay um did you know any did you know a person by the name of angie that lived in those apartments as well well me and her used to talk a lot okay and um how often would you talk to her well like twice a week or maybe sometimes a little bit more Okay. And um, do you know which apartment she lived in relation to yours? She lived in apartment eight. Okay. Was that close to yours? Yes. Okay. W is it in that picture? Yes. If we could have people's three back up, please. Which one is hers? The door with the, I mean, the door that it's open, the white door. Could you point at hers just so everyone can see? This one here. Okay. Thank you. And when did you live in these apartments? Oh, God. I don't know what month I moved in, but I was there about, about three months, okay. four months, something like that. Did you live uh, there during the month of July? Yes. Okay. And um, do you recall the date of July 17th? 
I think that's the day it happened, everything. Okay. And do you recall that from seeing a lot of police officers around there? When it happened, I seen a lot of officers there. But the next day, oh, I'm sorry about that's that. Right. I didn't mean to have it on. I'm sorry. That's all right. On, um, do you recall July 16th as well? I don't remember no more because it's been a while <laughs> and I really don't want to remember because it's, I just don't want to remember. Okay. And it, it, it was pretty tough from everything that happened? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about um, July 16th. Or let's talk about the last time you saw Angie alive. When I seen her, we were talking outside. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of things about her, her finding a job, and because mm -hmm. she really needed a job and everything. And I told her go to Swift, and they're hire you there. Mm -hmm. And I asked her how old she was, uh -huh. and she told me she was about 18, 19 years old. Okay. And was that on? Do you recall if that was the day before all the police showed up there when you were talking to her? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Okay. And. Um, you talked to police officers about this case a couple of times, right? Yes. And do you recall um, talking to them about seeing her on July 16th, the day before all the police were there? Yes. And that she came home that night? Yes. And do you recall what time you saw her come home that night? It was kind of late, but I don't know. I don't know what time it was. Okay. Um, do you recall telling... Uh, telling an officer on July 16th, um, you told an officer on July 24th that on July 16th she came home between 7 and 8 p.m.? Yes. Does that sound right? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and do you recall if you saw what car she was driving that night? Um, there was a green one, but they call it a PT Cruiser. I don't know how they call those kind of cars. A PT Cruiser? Is that yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And it was a green PT Cruiser? Yes. Okay. And then did you see her go into her apartment that night? Yes, I did. And were you outside when you saw this? Yes, we're, we're, it was me and my boyfriend and two friends. Okay. And in that picture, it showed kind of an outside area. Were you guys hanging out outside or out in front of the apartments? Well, I was right there on the stairs. Okay. Okay. And you recall seeing her get home that night? Yes. All right. Do you remember how she got in the house? No, I didn't. Okay. And I want to talk to you about the next day on July 17th. Do you recall that day? Yes. And I know you're trying to get it out of your memory. Um, do you recall uh, seeing anyone that, that you knew as Angie's sisters? I never knew Angie's sisters. Okay. Did you see anyone at her apartment that day? Yes. Okay. And who did you see there? I seen a real young lady, a young girl, but 2019, I don't know who she was. Okay. And did you see her at Angie's apartment? I seen her knocking on the door. Okay. Did she go in the apartment? No. Okay. Did she later come back to the apartment with another person? Um, when that happened, I was in my apartment mm -hmm. when she came back. Okay. So she came back later that day? Yes. And do you recall about what time it was? Was it in the afternoon? I think about 3 o'clock, something like that. Okay. And did you hear anything at 3 o'clock? I heard banging at my door, and okay. I thought it was my boyfriend who was banging on the door. And I told him, I said to myself, I go, why is he banging on the door when he has the key? Mm -hmm. When I opened it, I seen the young girl crying and another young girl. Both of them were crying and screaming, and they were saying, my sister, my sister, um, I don't want to say the word, but my sister's dead. Mm -hmm. I go, what? And I go, yes. And so I walked across, and I went in the apartment, and I seen her laying down. And I see that I didn't want to see. Uh -huh. And you, you saw Angie on the ground? Yes. Okay. And, and was there a blanket around her? Did you see anything like that? She had a blanket across from her laps, her legs. Okay. And, and when you saw this, what did you do? Well, they passed, the young girls passed the phone to me because they couldn't talk to the emergency 911. Mm -hmm. So I helped them out. And I was talking to them on the phone, what I seen and what, and they were telling me if I could give her, 
how you say that word. Um, well, you pull the microphone a little bit closer so we can hear you a little bit better. Um, I was talking to 911, and um, they were telling me if I can give her mouth to mouth, um, and I couldn't because she was real stiff, real cold. Mm -hmm. I couldn't move her. She was real. She couldn't move at all. Okay. So did you stay on the line with, were you on 911 then? Yes. Okay. Did you do anything else? And then they told me to remove anything that she, she had on her. I removed her blanket, but I couldn't move nothing else. She was real stiff, real cold. And where were the, um, you said two girls came screaming to your apartment. I think you later found out they were her sisters? One was a sister and the other one was a friend. Okay. And where were they while you were doing this? They were, I didn't let them go inside because I didn't want them to see what was wrong with Angie. Because uh -huh. it, it wasn't right for them to see it. Mm -hmm. So I told them to stay outside, you know, stay away. You know, I, I just finished talking to 911. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long had Angie lived there? Oh, God. I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. And did you, did you know Angie by any other names? What was her? I think Jason, something like that. Okay. Yes. And how long had you known her by both names? Well, I keep on watching her and the way she was moving, and I said to myself, she ain't no girl. Okay. I know she was a guy. Okay. Um, and so, did you? What, what name did you call her by? Angie. Okay. And on the night you saw her walk up to the apartment, yes. um, did you? Uh, did she have any purses with her or anything? She had a brown gold, brown and gold, um, in her purse, like design. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I saw. I see. Okay. And that night when you were in your apartment, did you hear anything? No. Okay. Were you home all night that night? Yes. Did you ever see Angie driving any other sort of car? A little four-door brown, a brown little car. Okay. Were you aware if um, she had roommates or anything like that? She had one, but I didn't see her that often in that apartment. Okay. I've seen her once, but not that often. And it, since it's entered into evidence, can we publish people's for? You also said this is a view from the apartment? Yes. Okay. And is that from standing up there on the top of those stairs? Yes. All right. And did you see where Angie parked that night? You saw yes. her? Yes. Uh -huh. Could you step down and show on the big screen, please? Where? She always used to park where this car is parked that right here. So where the, where the red uh, Explorer is, is where she normally parked? Yes. Okay. And is that where she was parked that night when you saw her? Yes. Okay. And, and you mentioned that you knew Angie was a male. Yes. And how long had you known that? Oh, about two days. Okay. Before this happened? Yes. Or no, a long time ago. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Cross-examination. Good afternoon. Now, back when you lived, uh, <coughs> 2025 Fourth Avenue in apartment number five. You lived there uh, with your boyfriend. I think you mentioned him before. Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And is that Nicolas Milan? Milan. Milan. Yes. I apologize. That's okay. 
And I think you stated, uh, testified a moment ago that you had lived there for approximately three or four months before this incident? Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you stated this a moment ago, but you spoke with a couple of different police officers regarding this case. Is that right? Yes. And you were there most, you were there meaning at the apartments most of the day on the 16th of January. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think a moment ago you testified that about 7.30 or 8 p.m. you were on the staircase, you were outside, is that right? We were all outside. Is that sort of considered a balcony area there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is one, the person that you, that you saw, the person that you know as Jason or Angie, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would it be true for me to say that at this point, when on the 16th of, of July of 2008, at that point you had known um, Jason or Angie for about two months? Would that, does that sound accurate to you? Mm, I'm not too sure, but when she moved there, it was a long time that she moved in there. I would think about three, two to three months, something like that. So it's possible that the two months is correct? Yes. Okay. And is it also true that your first impression of, of Jason or Angie was that of a female? You thought it was a female, is that right? No, I, I knew he was a man. So you're saying from the beginning you knew that this person was a man? Yes. Do you remember telling a police officer uh, in this case that you believed that it was a female, that, that this person was a female initially? When I first seen it, when I first seen her or him, I thought he was a girl. But then when I seen her walking, I knew that he was a male. The way he was walking, that's the reason I knew he was a, a male. Okay. Do you remember telling a police officer um, that it wasn't until later that you learned this person that you thought was a she was actually a he? Yes. And you're saying that that was because you saw this person walking and you believed that uh, they were um, they couldn't be a female based on what they were walking. Yes. But you never told any of the police officers that, is that right? No. So was it your understanding um, that this person was a male who dresses as a female? To tell you the truth, I never seen her dressed like a girl. She was always wearing shorts and a, a t-shirt on. I never seen her dressed like a, in a dress or nothing like that. But you would agree with me that girls do wear t-shirts and shorts? Huh? You, would you agree with me that when I say that girls do wear t-shirts and shorts? Well, guys does too. So you would agree? Yes. Okay. And um, Jason or Angie, um, had long hair, is that right? Mm, yes. Now you testified a moment ago that um, that he that you had spoken with him, that you had spoken with him on other occasions. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Would it be true for me to say that? Uh, um, Jason or Angie sounded like a female when he talked? When he talked or she talked, she sounded normal to me. All right, well, I'm asking you, did, did, to you, did it sound like a female or a male or what? To me, it sounded normal. I didn't, it, to me, it, it didn't matter if she was just talk to me. I never paid attention to it. So you're saying that you can't tell if it was a female or a male sounding voice? Is that what you're saying? Well, with her, no, I couldn't tell. Okay. Now, on the 16th of July, when Jason or Angie arrived at the apartments, um, I think you noticed that no one was no one arrived with him. Is that mm -hmm. right? So he was by himself at that point. Yes, she okay. was by herself. Okay. And then I think you spoke with him briefly, and then he went into his apartment. Yeah, we were talking a little bit, and then when I turned around, 
Um, she went to her apartment and I guess she walked in. Okay. And would it be true for me to say that you aren't sure uh, whether or not uh, he used a key to get into the apartment or whether or not someone let him in? I didn't know. I did not see. I just turned around and she walked in. Do you remember telling an officer that you believed um, that he actually did enter with a key? I never said that. You never said that? No. And you testified a moment ago that for the rest of the night, the rest of the night on July 16th, you didn't see or hear anything unusual. Is that right? No. So you didn't hear any fighting or arguing? Uh, and, I'm, and I'm speaking about coming from apartment number eight. No. Okay. You didn't hear any glass crashing or anything? No. And you actually went outside um, the morning, I guess it would be, of the 17th, which would be 12.30 a.m. Um, to smoke a cigarette, is that right? I went with my boyfriend to smoke a cigarette. I so don't smoke, he, I just, um, just went out with him because he could smoke a cigarette. And so you guys were outside on the, by the staircase, right? Sort of the, by the balcony. Okay. Yeah. And the balcony, again, is sort of that staircase yes. area. Uh -huh. Sort of a breezeway that goes through the, the apartments. Well, the whole, right? it's a balcony, and then in the middle is the, the stairs. Right. And then later on that morning of the 17th, you, you left the apartment fairly early in the morning. Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And it was later on that day, about 2.30, that you heard the, the knocking and the screaming about at your, at your three, door? About 2.30 at 3, yes. Okay. When police arrived, you sort of acted as a translator for them, is yes. that right? Judge, if I could have just a moment. Welcome to step down. Appreciate your time. You. Once you're settled in, if you could introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. My name is Jennifer Hogestad, H-O-G-E-S-T-A-D. Thank you. You may examine. Your Honor, may I approach the witness and take exhibits um, off the stand? Yes. Thanks. Ms. Hogestad, how are you employed? I work for Wells County Paramedic Services. And how long have you been employed there? Since 2004. What are your duties? I'm a paramedic that responds to 911 calls. <coughs> were you dispatched out in relation to this case? Yes. And where were you dispatched to? I believe the address is 2025 4th Ave, apartment number 8. And that's here in Greeley, Weld County? Yes. What time did you get that call? Um, approximately 2, 2.30 in the afternoon. Do you know why you were dispatched out? Yes. Why is that? An apparent cardiac arrest. Who were you with? I was with my partner. And what's his name? Darren Dalton. What did you find when you arrived on scene? Um, initially when we pulled up there was two women outside obviously distraught directing us upstairs towards an apartment. Which apartment were they directing you to? Number eight. What, and what did you find? Did you enter apartment number eight? I did. Okay, what did you find? Um, the front door was open. There was a screen door that was closed. 
Um, as we peered through the screen door, um, you could see somebody lying on the ground. As I entered the room, it was a living room. Um, it was nice and tidy. There was a mattress laying on the middle, a twin mattress laying in the middle of the um, living room floor. Then uh, against the wall, there was a glass table that had several different vases and frames and things of that sort. And between those two objects was the patient who was lying face up, what we call supine. Um, the feet were towards the door and the head was towards the wall. And did you make any observations of this person that you found? I did. Um, the patient was pulseless, apneic, not breathing. Um, there was a large amount of blood around the patient's head. Um, there was rigor or stiffening of the upper extremities. Uh, there was lividity, gravity-dependent lividity, lividity, excuse me, um, which means that the blood is not circulating anymore and kind of pulls down towards um, wherever the gravity is pulling. That was noted towards the back. Okay. Um, you said that there was a large pool of blood? Yes. Was that blood wet or dry? It was dry. And what does that mean to you? Um, it had been several hours. Did you move or touch this person at all? I did touch the left forearm to see if there was any rigor or stiffening of that extremity. And what observations did you make of this person's physical appearance? Um, there appeared to be um, some sort of trauma to the face that was either blunt or penetrating trauma. There was some deformity towards the face. Okay. And did you at some point um, decide whether or not this person, you'd already said they weren't breathing and they were pulseless. So at that point, what did you do? Um, I. Per our protocol, I need to call a doctor for a field pronouncement. So I was exiting. Um, I was exiting the apartment to make that call to the doctor. And what happened on your way out? May I stand and show the court? Your Honor, may she stand? Sure. Okay. Let's see here. If you'd like the jury to see, you may have to say, step out of the box. You can see me here. Okay. So as I was exiting the apartment, I was being very careful to avoid any to disturb any evidence, I was trying to walk around the body, and as I was doing so, I reached into my pocket, on my, taking my right front hand, reaching into my right front pocket to grab for my cell phone to call the doctor. As I did that, you can see it pushes my scissors out just slightly right underneath where that pocket is. And those are scissors that are on your right leg? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and it happened to grab the table, the glass top table, as I exited. It took the contents of the glass table and threw them onto the floor along with the glass tabletop. I replaced the glass tabletop and left the remaining um, vases and flowers scattered around the floor. Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat. And is this the same glass tabletop that you were just telling the jury about that was next to the wall and the victim was in between that and the twin mattress? Yes. And did you at that point, though, make the call that you were going to make? I did. I continued to exit the apartment um, and made the call to the doctor. Okay. And was there a field pronouncement made at some point? Yes. Did you notify anyone on scene about what had happened with you catching the edge of the table and knocking things over? Absolutely. Okay. And who was that? Do you remember? It was the first responding officer. Right? From Greeley? Yes. If I could have one moment, Your Honor. Ms. Hopestead, what is a field pronouncement? I asked you that, but we can explain it. Okay. A field pronouncement um, is only, a, it, as I, my understanding, is only a doctor can pronounce somebody dead. So what we have to do is we have to call into the hospital, into the ER, and speak with one of the doctors that are on duty. Um, and we advise them of a patient's condition. And then from what we advise them, um, would there have to meet so many certain criteria, they will then ground a field pronouncement over the phone from what we are able to tell them about the patient. And the victim in this case fit that definition because? Because there was no pulse, no breathing, there was gravity dependent lividity, which was the pooling of the blood, and rigor or the stiffening of the upper extremities. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you. I just have a couple of 
couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, you said that when you went into the apartment, um, it looked tidy. Is that? Yes. You, okay. And so did you notice any items on the floor? Do you recall seeing anything? Around? I don't remember seeing anything on the floor other besides the mattress okay. and the patient. And so you, you described knocking over the glass tabletop um, and some of the items that fell off. Do you recall specifically what items fell off the table? Everything that was on top of the table, specific snow. Okay. I think you said some flowers. Yes. Okay. A vase, maybe? Yes. Um, do you recall seeing like a little picture frame? I think there were picture frames. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. And so when you um, knocked over the table and those items fell on the floor, you left all of those on the floor? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, you didn't put any of them anywhere else or move anything around? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. Any redirect? No, no. Thank you. You're welcome to step down. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Next witness, please. Once you're settled in, if you can introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. Hello, I'm uh, Jimmy Esquibel. Last name is spelled E-S-Q-U-I-B-E-L. Thank you. You may examine. And Mr. Esquibel, um, can you tell the jury how you were employed July 17th of 2008? At that time, I was a Greeley police officer in the city of Greeley. And did that, have, have you since retired? Yes. Okay. And how long were you a police officer? At that time, approximately 20 years. And in July, uh, specifically on July 17th, what was your assigned duties, do you recall? Uh, street patrol in uh, the sector on 4th Avenue where this incident occurred. Okay. And on that day, did you respond or go to 2025 4th Avenue? Yes, I did. And do you recall, was that in the afternoon approximately? What time? It was approximately 1439, which is 239 p.m. Okay. And can you describe for the jurors what you observed when you arrived there? Uh, there were approximately seven to ten people on the lower level. It's a two-story apartment building, eight units altogether. The address is 2025 4th Avenue. I responded to unit number eight on the second floor, which is the northeast corner of the second floor upstairs. I was directed there by the crowd that was down below. There was a fire unit and a paramedic unit also on scene just before I arrived on scene. So I immediately responded upstairs to unit number eight. Yeah, Yes, yeah, th that's an aerial view of that particular area. Okay. And do you see the apartment? You oops, oops, is it a fair and accurate photo? Yes, it is. Okay. Your Honor, this time I move to admit People's Exhibit 59. Any objection? I'll set this here, and it'll actually come up. Why don't you turn around before it hasn't been admitted yet? So why don't you turn it around? Yeah. Any objection? Okay. I didn't think I'd object. Um, if we could put that on the screen. For the record, 59 is received into evidence. And Mr. Esquibel, could you step down and show the jurors where these apartments are located? Approximate location. You know, there's actually a, a pointer so that you don't stand in the front of the monitor. If you look in the witness stand, there's a pointer. And actually, we can zoom in on it, and you can tell us if this is the right area. Yeah. You don't mind. No, that's fine. I can't even read it, but I can't see it here <laughs> okay. to make references to where it's at. Okay. It should be right here. 2025, what that? And if we could zoom in there. Is that is it in that photo then? Yes, it is. And, and it is, is it this building, if I may approach? Sure. Right here. Yes. And if you could describe where on that, uh, where you saw these people outside the apartment. They were downstairs uh, in the front lawn area in front of the building. Okay. And if we could show people's number two. Do you recognize that photo? Yes, that's the building we're talking about. And is it that front area where the bushes are? Yes, it is. Okay. And when you arrived, who, who all was present? There, like I said, I don't know who they were exactly, but there were about seven to ten people down below on the lower level. There was a fire crew and a paramedic crew on scene as well. 
Okay, and did you talk to the paramedics? Yes. And, and did they update you on what they observed and what happened? Yes, when I got upstairs to unit number eight, uh, Dalton and Hogstad were already in the apartment. Uh, they advised me that they believed the victim to be deceased. So that time, all I did is did a, I did a quick cursory search for the, in the apartment to make sure there was no one else in there, no victims, no suspects, anything like that. Secured the scene and called uh, supervis uh, supervis uh, my supervisors and so forth. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did, did you, was there anyone else in the apartment when you walked through it? Just uh, Dalton and Hogstad, the paramedic unit. There were no other parties in the apartment at that point? Well, the victim. Okay. And um, as, a, as a patrol officer who's responding to a scene like this, do you have any other duties? Or did you have any other duties that day? Numerous other duties, but the primary duty at that time, once I was advised that the, the victim was deceased, was to make sure there was no one else in there, secure the scene, and go from there. Okay. After you had the, the, the scene secured, did you take up, did you do any other duties or? I maintained security at the uh, upstairs location at the, where the apartment was located. I did happen to speak to some witnesses later that happened to live there also that were trying to get to their apartments later. Okay. And did you also do anything else as far as parties that arrived at the scene? Yes, I maintained a log of people that were coming in, into and out of the scene. And you, you mentioned that you called a supervisor. What's the, what's the purpose of calling a supervisor? Well, when you have a major incident like that, you notify everybody. Okay. And were other officers dispatched to that yes. scene? Yes. Numerous officers were dispatched, investigations were notified, the coroner, and so on. Okay. And, and aside from speaking to witnesses and logging people in and out, did you have any other duties? Uh, and maintaining security? No, sir, I believe that was it. Okay. If I may have a moment. Sure. Nothing further. Thank you, cross-examination. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. When you were dispatched to 2025 Fourth Avenue, uh, the call came in uh, of a female unconscious, is that right? Yes. And when you arrived, you were directed to apartment number eight, is that correct? That's correct. And when you arrived, I know you testified about this a moment ago, but when you arrived, <laughs> there were paramedics already on scene, correct? Yes. And those paramedics were Darren Dalton and Jen Hogstead, is that right? Correct. And then you entered the apartment, correct? Yes. And when you entered the apartment, um, you observed what appeared to you to be a Hispanic female lying on the ground. That's correct. And it's your understanding that this uh, Hispanic female was the sick or injured female that was in question. That was the purpose of the call. That was my belief. And among the other duties that you testified to, um, you interviewed some of the residents of, yes. of this 2025 Fourth Avenue apartment complex, correct? Correct. And those people would be Nicholas Milan Otero. That was one of them. Romaldo Milan Castaneda. Yes. Uh, Julian Martinez Tranquillo. Tranquilino, yes. If I get up a moment, you're honest. Thank you. I have one further question. Can you redirect? Thank you. Welcome to Step Down. Appreciate your time. Can the parties please approach? So for the jurors' information, the next witness is Spanish-speaking only. Luis Mendoza is our managing court interpreter. He's a certified interpreter from the Spanish to English language and vice versa. He's employed by the court. Good afternoon, sir. If you can please come to the witness stand. Bef before you sit down, if you can face me, if you can face me, over here, if you can face the judge, if you can please raise your right hand, and do you, do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalties of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Why don't you have a seat? Make yourself comfortable. 
feel free to adjust the microphone. Siéntase libre para ajustar el micrófono. And if you could introduce yourself to the jury by stating your name and spelling your last name. Y pudiera usted, por favor, presentarse jurado a decir su nombre y también su apellido. Soy Romaldo Millán. Romaldo Millán Castañeda. Thank you. And can you spell your last name for us? Gracias. Y pudiera usted deletrear su apellido para nosotros? Millán. Millán. Mi. Mi. L. 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 I. I. Uh, and okay, thank you. Muy bien, gracias. You may examine. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Mr. Castaneda, where do you live right now? Señor Castaneda, ¿dónde vive usted ahora? On the 37th and uh, in Evans. On 37th and Evans. Okay. And were you living there in July of 2008? Muy bien, y estuvo usted viviendo ahí en julio de 2008. Ajá. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay. Did you um, live on 4th Avenue at any point in time? Bien, y en algún momento vivió, vivió usted por la avenida 4. Perdón. I'm sorry. Did you have an occasion to go to 4th Avenue, 2025 4th Avenue? ¿Tuvo usted alguna razón para ir al 2025 de la avenida 4? No, no, no comprendo. Uh, I don't understand. Okay. Were you, do you remember talking to police in July of last year? Muy bien, ¿recuerda usted haber hablado con la policía en julio del año pasado? No. No? Okay. Muy bien. Do you remember talking to a Robert Cash about knowing a party that lived on 4th Avenue last year that was involved in, that was murdered? ¿Recuerda haber hablado con un Robert Cash que acerca de una persona que vivía por la 4 avenida que fue asesinada? El año pasado. Que si yo hablé con ella. Did I talk to her? No, did you talk to the officer about this person? No, si usted habló con el agente acerca de esta persona. Agente, ¿a qué agente se refiere? No. What officer are you referring to? I don't... Officer Cash with the Greeley Police Department. El agente Cash con el departamento de la policía de Greeley. O oh, en, el, en el día de que yo llegué de trabajar allí o qué día de qué día me habla, es que no. Oh, the day that I got there from work, or what day? I, I don't know. Yes. Sí. The day you got there from work. Oh, El día que iba ahí de oh, sí. oh, yes. Okay. And they talked to you about remembering uh, the days before July 15th and July 16th of 2008? ¿Y hablaron con usted acerca de recordar los días del 15 y 16 de julio del 2008? Del 15 de julio, no. July 15th? No. No? no. Okay. Do you recall um, talking to the officer on July 24th about observing the victim of a homicide walking in and out of her apartment? Muy bien, recuerda usted haber hablado con el agente acerca de el homicidio, pero el día 24 de julio cuando entraba y salía de su apartamento? Uh, uh, sí. Uh, yes. So you remember that? Entonces usted recuerda eso? Sí. Yes. And, and do you recall if that was July 16th when you saw this person walk into her apartment? ¿Y recuerda usted si fue el 16 de julio cuando usted vio a esta persona entrar a su apartamento? Pues exactamente el día, ¿no? Pero, o sea, el día que... que yo llegué del trabajo fue cuando vi yo la persona. Not the exact day, but when I got home from work, that's when I saw that person. Okay. And... Uh, do you, would it be correct if the officer put July 16th, 2008 into his report? Muy bien, entonces sería correcto si el agente puso el 16 de julio de 2008 en su informe. Yeah, I think so. And um, can you describe for the jury what you saw uh, outside of the, when you saw this person walk up to her apartment? Y puede usted describirle al jurado qué es lo que usted vio cuando la vio a ella acercarse a su apartamento? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Can you, can you describe that for the jury? ¿Puede describirle eso al jurado? Uh -huh. Ajá. Did she park her car? ¿Estacionó ella su carro? Sí. Yes. And what kind of car was that? ¿Y qué tipo de carro era? Uh, PT Cruiser. PT Cruiser. Okay. And did, did you know this person that drove the car? ¿Y conocía usted a esta persona que manejaba el carro? Uh, no sé, no, no su nombre, no nada de eso. Not the name or anything. Muy poquito lo, lo veía. I saw her very little. Okay, but you knew who this person was? Muy bien, pero usted sabía quién era esta persona. Mm. 
¿Cómo no? No, no, no lo entiendo. What do you mean? I, I don't understand. You just knew where to live in that area? Solo sabía que ella vivía en esa área. Oh, sí. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And, and did you know that she lived in the apartments right there? Muy bien. ¿Y sabía usted que ella vivía en los apartamentos ahí? Sí. Yes. And would you recognize the apartments if you saw them? ¿Y si usted viera los apartamentos, lo reconocería? Sí. Yes. If we could pull up people's number three. Pudiéramos mostrar la prueba del estado número tres. Do you recognize those apartments? ¿Reconoce usted esos apartamentos? Sí. Yes. And is this um, the apartments you're referring to when you saw the person park their PT cruiser that they walked into? ¿Y son estos los apartamentos a los cuales se refirió usted cuando vio la persona estacionar su PT cruiser y entrar ahí? ¿Qué si estos son? Are you asking if these are them? If that's the apartments that she lived in. Si, es, son, es, si esos son los apartamentos sí. que ella vivía. Yes. And on July 16th, do you remember what you saw her do after she parked her car? Y el 16 de julio de 2008, ¿recuerda usted qué vio que hizo ella después de que estacionó su carro? Sí. Yes. And what, and what was that? ¿Y qué fue? Bajó de su carro. She got off her car. Subió las escaleras. Went up the stairs. Nos dijo la buenas tardes. Said, good afternoon. Llegó y tocó la puerta. Y knocked on the door and went in. Okay. So you saw her knock on the door. Muy bien, entonces usted vio que tocó la puerta. Sí. Yes. And someone let her in. Y alguien la dejó pasar. Sí, alguien la abrió. Yes, someone opened. And did you know, did you see that person? Y vio usted a esa persona. No. No. <coughs> And was she alone when she got out of her car? <coughs> y estaba ella sola cuando se bajó de su carro. Sí. Yes. Yes. She was alone. And where were you standing when you saw her? ¿Y dónde estaba parado usted cuando usted la vio a ella? En las, en las escaleras. On the stairs. That were in that picture. Que estaban en esa, en el retrato. Uh -huh. uh -huh. okay. I may have one moment. Permite un momento. Uh -huh. Claro. Uh -huh. I have no further questions. No tengo más preguntas. Ms. Martin. Sí, Martin. Gracias. Hello. Hola. Hello. Hello. So this this um, this person that you that you were just talking about, um, you saw her enter an apartment. Is that right? Entonces esta persona que usted que usted acaba de mencionar, usted la vio entrar a un apartamento. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and you had seen her around before this date. Is that right? Y usted la había visto alrededor de ahí antes de esta fecha, ¿cierto? Sí, como uno de esos dos. Yes, sí. once or twice, something like that. Okay. Muy bien. And this person looked to you like a female, is that true? Y para usted esta persona tenía aspecto de hembra, ¿es cierto? Sí. Yes. Was this person wearing makeup? ¿Llevaba puesto maquillaje esta persona? No, no recuerdo yo la visto bien. Así que digamos que... I don't remember exactly. I, I don't know exactly. Okay. Can you remember how many times you had seen her before uh, July 16th? Recuerda usted cuántas veces la había visto usted ahí antes del 16 de julio? Como unos dos. Casi no la veía. Two, I hardly saw her. But she always appeared to you to be a female, is that right? Pero para usted ella siempre tenía el aspecto de ser hembra, ¿es cierto? Uh -huh. Ajá. And you testified a moment ago that when she arrived at the apartment, she parked her, her car. Is that right? Y usted atestiguó hace un momento que cuando ella llegó al apartamento, ella estacionó su carro, ¿cierto? Uh -huh. Ajá. And then you saw her walk up to uh, an apartment door. Y luego usted vio que ella se fue caminando hacia la puerta de un apartamento. Uh -huh. Ajá. And she knocked on that door, is that right? Y ella tocó en la puerta, ¿cierto? Uh -huh. uh -huh. Ajá, ya. Yeah. And that somebody let her in. Y que alguien le dejó pasar. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you cannot, you don't know whether or not the person who uh, let her in was a male or a female. Y usted no sabe si la persona que le dejó pasar era hombre o mujer. No, no, los conozco, no. No, I don't know them. You didn't see this person at all. Usted no vio para nada. No. No. If I could have a moment here. Permite un momento, su señoría. Thank you, sir. Gracias, señor. Okay. I have no okay. further questions, Your Honor. Thank, Thank you. Can you read your Gracias, yeah. segundo interrogatorio. Just briefly, did you live in those apartments that were on the screen? Solo brevemente. ¿Vivió usted en el apartamento que estaba en la pantalla? Sí. 
Okay. Yes. And did you hear anything on that night of July 16th? Yes, could you hear something on that night of July 16th? No. No. Okay. No. And, Nothing. Where did you live in those apartments? Where did you live in those apartments? Can I show them to you on? If we put people's number three back up, si did you see them in the picture? Uh -huh. okay. On that side. On, on the side. left side? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. On the top floor or the bottom floor? The top floor. If I may approach your honor? On this side? En este lado, ajá, en el piso arriba, ajá. On the back side of the apartments or the front side? En la parte de atrás o frente de los apartamentos? No, frente. No, en frente de los apartamentos. Okay. Okay. I have no further questions. No tengo más preguntas, gracias. Any recross? Segundo contra interrogatorio. Any recross? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Segundo contra interrogatorio. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Appreciate your time. Señor, se puede retirar. Apreciamos su tiempo. Okay. Okay. We're going to take our afternoon break for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. I want to again instruct you, and I'll be doing this for every break and when we recess for the day, that until the trial is completed, you must not discuss the case with anyone. That includes your family, people involved in the trial, other jurors, or anyone else. If someone approaches you and tries to discuss the trial with you, please let me know about it immediately. It's also important that you must not read or listen to any news reports of the trial. Do not in any way try to gain information about the case outside of the courtroom. That includes no research on the internet, medical or law books, or the encyclopedia or dictionaries. Finally, it is especially important that you not form or express any opinion on the case until it is finally submitted to you. And so why don't we get started up at uh, five minutes to four, okay? If everybody can please rise for the jury. We were outside the presence of the jury. Are there any other issues before we recess? I, I do have one. Um, regarding, I've been speaking with Mr. Miller, and it's my understanding, I think that the prosecution is planning to, obviously they used one in opening, show some of the photographs of the victim on that. Um, I, I think that I would request that in the future when those are being admitted that they be published by passing to the jurors rather than published on the screen. I think number one reason is that the media, and I don't know if it's being shown on TV or not, but the other, but the main reason, and I think the most important reason is that I think it's likely to evoke an emotional response from various people in the courtroom. I know that during opening statements I heard some crying. I, I think it's inappropriate to have this published to the entire courtroom. Thank you, Mr. Miller. You know, I, I'm assuming that uh, the media said they weren't going to show those photos. I thought I heard him tell the court that at some point. Um, and uh, based I think that's that, I think that's correct. And based on that, I was comfortable with putting them on the screen. I think the court can advise people in the courtroom not to have emotional outbursts, and obviously, if they do. They need to be removed from the courtroom, not change our evidence we're presenting to the court. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to deny the request. Uh, it seems to me that from what I've seen so far, there hasn't been any emotional outbursts that were unreasonable or that would taint the jury in any way. If that were to occur, I would perhaps reconsider my decision. Uh, and it seems to me that putting it on the big screen TV rather than showing them a photograph um, is a more efficient way. They can all see it at the same time, and they're getting the same contents. And so um, at this point, I don't see how the jury is being tainted or how the defendant is receiving an unfair trial for using that procedure. Again, if it becomes a problem in the future, I'll address it. So we'll see you at five minutes to four with the next witness for the prosecution. Sir, can you please tell us your name? Señor, puede usted por favor decirnos su nombre? Thomas Nicolás. Thomas Nicolás. Thank you. Can you spell your last name for us? Gracias. Puede deletrear su apellido para nosotros. Is it N I N I C H O L O L A S? L A S. Yes. Thank you. You may examine. Gracias. Puede interrogar. Thank you, Your Honor. Gracias, señor. Um, if we could pull up photo number two, please. Vamos a poner la foto número dos, por favor. 
And if you could look at the big screen over here. Do you recognize that photo? Reconoce usted esa foto? Sí. Yes. And how do you recognize that? ¿Cómo es que usted la reconoce? Porque ahí vivo en donde está esa casa y vivo yo. Because that's where I live. I live in that house. And your honor, permission for him to step down. Eso sería pido permiso para que él se baje. Could you point to the house you live in? Puede apuntar. Puede apuntar usted a la casa donde usted vive. Hay una apuntadora ahí atrás de usted. If you can step down. Puede bajarse. Okay. Okay. I live in this house. Okay. Okay. You can have a seat. Thank you. Puede tomar asiento. Gracias. Are you living there right now? Yes. <coughs> Did you say yes? Dijo sí. Sí. Yes. Sir, you're welcome to speak in the Spanish language so the interpreter can interpret you. You don't have to speak in English if you're not comfortable in English. Usted puede hablar en español para que el intérprete le ayude en eso si no se siente a gusto hablando en inglés. Pues como quiera, mejor hablar en español. Well, either way, I guess in Spanish is better. How long have you lived at that house? ¿Cuánto tiempo tiene viviendo en esa casa? Pues ahorita como un año y medio, casi. About a year and a half now, almost. Okay. And do you recall July 17th of 2008? ¿Y recuerda usted el 17 de julio de 2008? Sí. Yes. Okay. And you remember talking to police officers on that day? ¿Y recuerda haber hablado con agentes de la policía ese día? Sí. Yes. And you talked to them about uh, seeing a person that lived in the apartments next door? ¿Y usted habló con ellos acerca de ver a una persona que vivía en los apartamentos enseguida? Sí. Yes. And can you remember what you told police officers you saw the night before? ¿Y puede usted recordar lo que usted le dijo a los agentes de la policía la noche anterior? Sí. Yes. And what did you tell them? ¿Y qué les dijo usted a ellos? Pues yo lo que le dije con ellos es que yo nomás vi un carro el, el, el día antes de que pasara las cosas. Vi esa persona, llegó con un carro negro, la parqueó y salió del carro con una bolsa en la mano y, y se, met, se fue caminando, se metió en adentro del el apartamento. Pues. I told them that I saw the person get there and park the car there the day before. It was a black car. She, they parked the car, <coughs> got off the car with the bag, and then walked into the apartment. Okay. What kind of car was it? ¿Qué tipo de carro era? Pues es un Chrysler, pero es un Chrysler, pero es un carro negro que viene siendo como cerrado encima todo. No sé muy bien qué clase de carro es, pero es un clase Chrysler. Well, it's a Chrysler. It's black. It's kind of covered on top. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know exactly what time, what type of car, but it's a black Chrysler. Okay. And do you know uh, which apartment the person that drives that Chrysler lives in? Muy bien. ¿Y sabe usted en qué apartamento vive la persona que maneja ese Chrysler? No sé muy bien, pero yo vi el, o sea, donde estaba viviendo. Yo lo vi cuál es. Es el único, la entrada al donde están las, los escalones. A la pura entrada es al entrar a esa puerta. Ahí está la, el apartamento. I saw the car uh, and I saw the person go into the uh, apartment where the stairs are. Okay. Was it in that picture that was just up there? Fue en ese retrato que acabamos de enseñar ahí arriba. Sí. If we could yes. put a uh, picture two, please. Podemos poner la foto dos, por favor. May I approach this? Puedo acercarme. Claro. May the witness approach. O puede testigo acercarse. Where did Where does this person live? Donde vive esta persona? Donde está esa puerta? Where that door is? And, and for the record, you're pointing to the uh, middle of the brick apartment building towards the right side. Yes, the first door as you go up the stairs, that's where I saw her. And can you show the jury where you were standing when you saw her? When I came out of the house, I went down the stairs and I came over here next to the box where you put the mail in. I was just sitting there. Okay. 
And what time was that? Do you recall? About 8.30 or 9, between 8.30 or 9. And <clears throat> was, was this person alone? Yes. And where was that? Where, where did that person park their car? Well, it's parked over on this side. You can't see it right now. If we put up photo four, please. Do you recognize that photo? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Do you recall where the car was parked? Right here where that red truck is, she got there and parked right there. Okay, thank you. You can sit back down. <coughs> did, how late did you stay outside of your house that night? ¿Cuán tarde se quedó usted afuera de su casa esa noche? Pues como unos 15 minutos, no más estaba ahí afuera. Well, about 15 minutes, I was just out there. <coughs> okay. Um, when was the next time you left your house? ¿Cuándo fue la próxima vez que usted dejó, salió de su casa? Pues no más, no más esa vez fue afuera porque no más tenía que ir a agarrar unas cosas en mi carro, es todo. Casi no, no salgo afuera. Well, just that time I went out to get some stuff in my car. I really don't go out much. Mm -hmm. Did you leave the house the next day, the next morning? So fue usted de la casa el siguiente día, la siguiente mañana? Sí. Yes. And when you left the next morning, did you notice that uh, Chrysler parked over there? Y cuando usted se fue la siguiente mañana, ¿se fijó si el Chrysler estaba estacionado allá? Si me fijé, no, no está el carro allí. I did notice the car wasn't there. Okay. And do you know the person that lives in that apartment or... Not. ¿Y conoce usted a la persona que vive en ese apartamento o no? No. No. Okay. Me pongo. Permíteme un momento. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Uh, just for the record, I, for the court's record. Uh, he pointed to the gray house to the left of the apartment building in People's Three. Thank you. Cross examination. Bien, su contra interrogación. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Now, as you testified a moment ago, um, around the time of January 16th of, of 2008, you lived at the house at 2031 4th Avenue? Sí. Yes. And you lived there with your brother? Y usted vivió allí con su hermano. Sí. Yes. And I think you testified that on the 16th of July of 2008, uh, you were outside uh, in the yard area of your home at about 8.30 or 9, is that right? Y creo que usted testigó que el 16 de julio de 2008 usted estaba fuera en la área de su yarda como a las 8 y media, 9 de la noche, ¿cierto? Sí. Yes. And this is when you see the person that appeared to you to be a female park her car and then walk up to the apartment complex. Y es cuando usted ve a la persona que tiene aspecto de hembra estacionar su carro y subir al edificio de los apartamentos. Mm -hmm. Sí. Uh, yes. And this person that appeared to you to be a female uh, was wearing dark clothes and had long hair, is that right? Y esta persona que tenía aspecto de ser hembra traía ropa oscura y pelo largo. Sí. Yes. If I could have a moment, Your Honor. Permite un momento, su señoría. Thank you, sir. Gracias. I don't have any other questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Yo no tengo más preguntas. Redirect. You mentioned uh, you were asked about seeing her walk across the street. D did you say if she was carrying anything? Usted mencionó cuando se le preguntó que la vio estacionar su carro y cruzar la calle, vio que iba cargando algo. Sí. Yes. And what was she carrying? ¿Y qué iba cargando? Pues nomás yo vi una, una bolsa que trae en la mano como, como las bolsas del, cuando agarras un, una cerveza de los que usan como color 
pues como papel que traías como donde <coughs> cuando compras una cerveza y te dan una bolsa más o menos así era la bolsa que trae en la mano a la izquierda the bag in her hand was like the ones that um, come with the beer that you buy like when you go buy a beer they give you the paper bag and um, she had one in her left hand thank you no further questions gracias no tengo más preguntas nothing further your honor thank you thank you sir you're welcome to step down we appreciate your time all right thank you And so why don't you introduce yourself to the jury by telling them your name. Okay, my name is Efrain Nicholas. Thank you. You're welcome to examine. Thank you. And for the record, how do you spell your last name? Uh, N-I-C-O-L-A-S. Okay. And are you related to Thomas Nicholas? Yeah, he's my brother. Okay. I wanna, uh, if we could put up photo number two. If you could look on the screen right there to your right. Do you recognize that picture? Yeah, okay. I live over there. What's that? I live there. You live there? Yeah. And do you live in the gray house on the left side of the picture? Yeah. Okay. And how long have you lived there? Mm, almost like two years, I think. Two years? Yeah. Okay. And do you recall July 17th of 2008? Mm, I don't really remember what day was it, but it, yeah. Okay. Do you remember talking to the police on July 17th? Yeah. Okay. And, and do you remember talking to them about um, coming home uh, yeah. early in that morning? Yeah. At midnight, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what did you tell them? I just told them that I saw two guys standing there when I came over home. Okay. Yeah. And where did you see two guys standing? Uh, they were just standing there in front of the apartment. And, and uh, can you... Can you your Honor, could the witness approach the screen? Sure. You can get up and can you point on the screen where you saw two people standing? I saw them standing up here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Did you want to describe that for the record? For the record, uh, the witness pointed to the brick building and, and there's a dark hallway in the middle of it What he, is what he pointed at. Thank you. <clears throat> and... Um, when you got home, did you notice if there was a dark colored Chrysler parked in front of the apartments? Mm, I didn't see any car. The car wasn't there? Mm -mm. Okay. And what time did you get home that morning? Like 12.30 or so. So, like so, so it would have been 12.30 Sunday morning? Yeah. So you were out on the night of the 16th? Yeah. May I have one more, Your Honor? <coughs> Nothing further, thank you. Thank you, cross-examination. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. You were aware that around that time, the, the 16th of July of 2008, that there was supposedly a female that had, that had died in that building? Yeah. And you had seen that, that the person that you believed to be a female many times in the past, is that true? Yeah, I saw her like a couple of times or three times all day. And would it be fair for you to say that that person uh, that you saw as a female appeared to you to be just that, a female, is that right? Yeah. I want to talk just briefly about these, these males that you were referring to before, okay? Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Now, you said you saw these two males standing in uh, sort of the breezeway, the balcony area of this apartment complex, yeah. is that right? And you saw them on the 17th of July of 2008 at appro approximately 1230, is that yeah. right? And I'm sorry, that's 1230 a.m. Yes. Right. And, and you can't you can't identify who either of those two males. I don't know. I didn't really pay attention to them because they were my neighbors, so I didn't pay attention to them. Sure. I just walk into the house. 
And you didn't see these two males go into any apartment, did you? <coughs> no, because I walked in my house, so they were just still there when I went inside, so I don't know. Okay, and you didn't see these males come out of any apartment, no, is that right? I didn't. Okay. If I could have a moment, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. I have no further questions. Thank you. Redirect. No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to step down, sir. We appreciate your time. Next witness, please. The people of Tom Baker. Baker. I'm Officer Baker. Uh, B-A-K-E-R. Thank you. Your first name? Jared. Thank you. You may examine. Thank you. By whom are you employed, Officer Baker? The Greeley Police Department. And how long have you been employed there? Uh, five years. What are your duties at the Greeley Police Department? Um, force the city and state laws, patrol the city. So you're a patrol officer? Yes. Were you working on July 17th of last year? Yes, I was. Were you dispatched out in relation to this case? Yes, I was. Do you remember where you were dispatched to? 2025 Fourth Avenue, number eight. And that's here in Greeley, Weld County, Colorado? Yes. Okay. And do you know why you were dispatched out? Uh, yes, there was a call of a possibly deceased person <coughs> in the apartment. What did you find when you arrived on scene? Can you tell the jury? Uh, when I arrived on scene, the first officer on scene, Officer Escabel, uh, asked if I would start interviewing people who were possible witnesses on the front sidewalk. And did you do that? Yes, and I contacted uh, the victim's sister, Monica Murguia. And what did Miss Murguia have to tell you? Uh, she immediately told me that when she walked into the apartment to check on her. This is for effect on listener. It goes to why Officer Baker then did what he did. So the court's going to overrule the objection. The jury needs to understand that uh, what this other person told the officer is not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It's simply um, explaining why the officer took subsequent actions. You're welcome to continue. Go ahead. She told me that when she went into the apartment to check on her sister, uh, she couldn't locate the car keys to the uh, vehicle that she lets her the victim drive. Uh, so she believed that the whoever did that to her sister uh, also had the vehicle. She told me it was a 2003 green PT Cruiser. I was in the passenger side front hubcap. And were you able to obtain license plate information and VIN information from this person, Ms. Murguia? Yes, she did give that to me. And what did you do with that information? Uh, the, using the license plate number and the vehicle description, I uh, aired that information as a what we call a BOLO, which is be on the lookout for surrounding agencies in the Weld County area to be on the lookout for that vehicle in case they see it as it, uh, the possible suspect may be driving the vehicle. And did you say that that BOLO went out to Weld County areas? Did it go out anywhere else? Uh, no, just local Weld County agencies. Okay. And at some point then, was this information also given to a wider range of people other than Weld County? Uh, not, uh, I don't recall. You don't recall? You don't, do you recall ever having NCIC, CCIC, or dispatch enter this information into their system? I believe at a later time, but I did not do that. Okay. One moment. No further questions. Thank you. Cross examination. <clears throat> Good afternoon, officer. Hello. Um, when you arrived on scene that day, you met first with Monica Murguia, correct? Yes. Was there anybody else with her at the time? There, were, yeah, there were several people on the sidewalk. Okay. Her sister also. Okay. Was that sister Ashley? Do you remember? Yes. Okay. And you talked to her briefly while you were there on scene, correct? To, to Monica Murguia. Yes. I'm sorry. And then after that, um, you did you drive Ms. Murguia to the police station? I, I don't recall. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you go to the police station yourself with the other, with other individuals? Yes, I, I met other family members at the police station. Okay. And when you arrived there, 
Um, when you say other family members, you're referring to family members of the deceased? Yes. Okay. And were they, they were all in the same room together waiting, is that right? I believe they went into separate rooms. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any redirect? No, no. Thank you. You may step down. Appreciate your time. Next witness. The people are called Brian Phillips. My name is Brian Phelps. Last is spelled P-H-E-L-P-S. Thank you. Thank you. How are you employed? Uh, Thornton Police Department. And what is your position there? A uh, patrol officer. And how long have you been employed in that position? With Thornton for close to three years now. Were you a police officer elsewhere? Yes. And how long have you been a police officer? Total 13 years now. And you said you're on patrol, is that correct? Yes. What are your duties as a patrol officer? Respond to dispatch calls, um, initiate our own activities, making traffic stops, um, try to get warrants served if we have some slow time. Were you working for the Thornton Police Department on July 30th of last year? Yes, I was. Did you receive a radio call dispatching officers to 9440 Hoffman Way in Thornton? Yes. Do you know why that dispatch <clears throat> went out? Uh, there was a noise complaint. And why did you respond to that? The, that apartment complex we've had problems with before, and uh, I was in the area and I wasn't busy. Um, if two officers were already en route, but it would be best to have three or more there. And where were you when you received this call? I was on Thornton Parkway. Um, Thornton Parkway at about race, I think, when the call came out. About how far is that from the location you were going to respond to? In a straight line, it's pretty close, but it's old downtown, so you have to, or old town Thornton, so you have to kind of go around. You have to get up on Washington. Thornton Parkway is 92nd. You have to get on Washington to 95th. 95th dead ends at the 9440 Hoffman address. It makes a curve, then you pull into the apartment complex. Okay. Well, you were on route to that location. Did you receive any other information? Yes. Uh, dispatch had advised the vehicle was associated with a felony. And right before you arrived at the scene, did you um, receive any other information about any other officers that were there already? Yes. Um, Officer Stricker had advised that she had arrived on scene. And then as I was pulling up, uh, Sergeant Fusetti was arising on, arriving on scene as well. And who was there before you arrived? Do you know? Officer Thomas. Okay. And can you tell the jury what it is that you saw when you arrived at that location? <clears throat> When I pulled up the location, I saw a, a PT cruiser with the door open. Um, officer Thomas had his gun out, and as did Officer Stricker. You can see this apartment complex before you can pull into it. The road dead ends and then curves flat with it until you get to the entrance. So as soon as you come on 95th from Washington, you can see the entire complex, or you can see the entire area that they were in. But you can't get there. You have to, you have to jog around a little bit to get in there. Um, and by the time I had uh, rolled up on scene and got on my vehicle, um, he was being taken into custody, so. Okay. Were you advised at any point that this car was associated with something other than a felony hit? Objection, relevance. Your Honor, it goes to why he why I think he then took some steps that he did. So the court's going to overrule the objection pursuant to Rule 401. The vehicle, we were advised the vehicle was associated with a homicide out of Weld County, out of Greeley. Okay, and what, what did you do because of that? Or what did all the officers do because of that? Uh, after the subject was taken into custody, the vehicle was closed and... I, I guess I'm trying to ask you, I'm yes. sorry. <laughs> When you all converged on scene, was yes. this different than a regular noise complaint that you Oh, yes, very to? much so. At, at, the, at the point from when this vehicle is associated with any felony, it changes. Uh, yeah, it, it turns more into a, a high-risk contact as opposed to just turn the music down. So can you explain to the jury how that contact was effectuated, I yes. guess? Yes. Um, if it becomes into a high-risk situation, um, you, you take tactical points, you, you kind of fan out and triangulate on the whoever's you're looking at. Uh, guns are drawn, guns are pointed at, at the subject, and 
orders are called out so you can try to gain verbal compliance through the subject before you go hands-on with them, which is what we did. Okay. And then at some point the subject was taken into custody? Yes, ma'am. And do you see that person here in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you please point him out and describe something that he's wearing for the jury? Uh, yes, ma'am. Blue and white striped shirt uh, sitting here between the female and the tan and the male in the black jacket. Thank you. Your Honor, would you let the record reflect that this witness has identified the defendant subject to cross? Very well. So um, let's go back a little bit. Right when you arrived on scene, tell the jury exactly what it is that you witnessed. Right as I got on scene, the... Well, as I, as I got on scene, com, uh, commands were being given to the subject already, um, which he complied to. And I was working more of a rear cover, kind of watching what was going on. Plus, if there's one person, there's always two. So I'm watching out to make sure nobody else is going to run up on from behind us. But uh, uh, commands were given. He complied with the commands. Uh, and he was handcuffed and taken into custody. And who took him into custody, do you know? I'm not specific on that. There were two officers there who actually nabbed him up and took him into custody. I believe it was Officer Thomas. I'm not sure. At some point, did you w walk up to the defendant and search him or anything of that sort? He was being walked back from his vehicle, and then I took control of him, walked him to a police car, and then I searched him, yes. Okay. And did you speak to him during this time? Or did he speak to you? Yes, he spoke to me. Um, as I was patting him down, again, um, he stated that he had stole the vehicle. He said he stole this car. And did you say anything in response to that statement? It kind of took me as, off, as surprised. Um, it, it, it just wasn't something I was expecting to hear, so I just asked him to clarify it. I said, what? And he said that he stole this vehicle, that the keys were in it, and he just took it. And then at that point, was the defendant transported elsewhere? Yes, ma'am. OK. Did you have any further contact with the defendant after that point? No, I did not. OK. If I could have one moment. No further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Good afternoon, officer. Good afternoon, sir. I think you stated a moment ago that Mr. Andrade was cooperative with all the officer's commands. Is that right? It appeared so, yes. And he obviously didn't try to run away or run from you guys at all, did he? No, sir. He did not. No further questions. Thank you, officer. No, Thank you, officer. You may step down. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Next witness, please. The people would call Brian Phelps. I'm sorry, Joe Thomas. Last name. Joe Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S. Thank you. Thank you. Were you employed by Thornton Police Department on July 30th of last year? Yes, I was. As a police officer? Yes. What were your duties there? I was assigned to the patrol unit for uh, graveyard shift. And were you on duty that day, July 30th? I was. Were you dispatched out on a loud noise complaint that evening? Yes, I was. What time was that? Uh, it was a little after midnight. Were you patrolling alone? I was in my own patrol car, yes. Okay. Solo unit. And where were you dispatched to? Uh, 9440 Hoffman Way in District 2 of the City of Thornton. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. And just for the record, I've already shown defense counsel what I've marked as People's Exhibit 26. Mr. Thomas, do you know what that is? Yes. What is it? Uh, that's the sign for the apartment complex of which I was dispatched to. At 9440 Hoffman Way? Correct. And that's a fair and accurate representation of the sign outside that building? Yes, it is. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I'd move to admit and publish People's Exhibit 26. Any objection? No objection. People's 26 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. And you can see on the screen next to you, that's the picture? Ah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you tell the jury a little bit about what it is that you found when you arrived on scene? I was dispatched on a loud noise complaint, and uh, I was advised that there was five parties at that location near Building E, uh, making loud noise, keeping the uh, reporting parties' children awake. Upon arrival, uh, as I was driving southbound on Hoffman Way, I could hear a loud stereo coming from a vehicle uh, that I identified as a green PT Cruiser. I then uh, drove into the parking lot towards the vehicle and uh, trained my spotlight on it and called out with the plate. Thank you. Your Honor, may I approach the witness again? Yes. And for the record, I've shown defense counsel what we have marked as People's Exhibit 29. Mr. Thomas, do you know what that is? 
Yes. Um, what is that? That's the PT Cruiser that I was in contact with that night. Okay. Is that a fair and accurate representation of the car that you saw on that evening? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, I'd move to admit and publish People's Exhibit 29. No objection. 29 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. And on the screen next to you again, that's the green PT Cruiser you're talking about? Yes. Okay. May I approach again? Yes. And I've shown defense counsel as well what I've marked as People's Exhibit 32. Mr. Thomas, do you know what that is? Uh, it's the same location. Uh, the PT Cruiser is parked in the same location where I contacted it okay. that night. And that's a fair and accurate representation of what you saw that evening when you arrived? It is. Except for the slider, I guess. Right. <laughs> okay, Your Honor, at this time I'd move to admit and publish People's 32. No objection. People's 32 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. So the green PT Cruiser is there on the left-hand side? Yes. Okay, if I could zoom in on that location. Is that the car that you're talking about? It is. Okay, thank you. Was there someone in the vehicle? There was. Okay, and was it just one person? Yes. What did you do when you contacted that person? I noticed that there was beer cans uh, laying outside the vehicle, and I noticed uh, that the occupant was in the driver's seat. Uh, and I approached the vehicle from the passenger side uh, to see into the car to see what he was doing in there. And before you did that, did you happen to run the license plate of this car? I did. I called it out with dispatch, and uh, dispatch had told me that it was possibly involved in some type of felony at that point. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes. Showing you what I've marked as People's Exhibit 8, 28, which I've also shown to Defense Counsel. What is that? It's the license plate on the PT Cruiser. The same PT Cruiser that we've been talking about? Yes. And also a fair and accurate representation of what you saw that evening? Correct. Thank you. At this time, I'd move to admit and publish People's 28. No objection. People's 28 is received into evidence. You're welcome to publish. Thank you. And that's the license plate number? Yes, it is. Okay. So you said that you approached from the passenger side? Correct. Okay. Were you able to see the person who was in the car at that point when you approached? Yes. And do you see that person here in the courtroom today? I do. Can you please point him out and describe something that he's wearing? I seated at the defense table wearing a uh, blue striped shirt. Thank you. Your Honor, would you let the record reflect that this witness has also identified the defendant? Very well. So what was the defendant doing as you approached? As I approached, I noticed he was uh, making rapid movements underneath the seat as if he was reaching for something underneath the seat. And what did you do at that point? At that point, fearing that he may be uh, reaching for a weapon and knowing that the vehicle is involved in some type of felony, I placed him at gunpoint and ordered him to show his hands, put his hands up. And as that happened, did you learn any new information? At the same time as I was, I was giving him the commands, uh, dispatch aired to the other officers who were responding to cover me that the vehicle was related to a homicide in Greeley. And the did the defendant comply with your commands? Yes. Okay. And what happened at that point? Uh, at that point, he just put his hands up, uh, his hands started to shake, and then uh, he leaned over towards the driver's side doors if he was going to exit. What did you do? At that point, I gave him a, a firm command to not move. Um, did, oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and he stayed still at that point until cover officers arrived. And about how long was it until the other cover officers arrived? About 20 seconds or so. Okay, and which officers were those? It was Officer Stricker and Sergeant Puzzi. What happened once they arrived? When they arrived, we ordered the uh, defendant out of the car and placed him into custody without incident. Okay. And at some point, did he get transported to the Thornton Police Department? I was instructed by Sergeant Puzzetti to take him to the police department and book him on a traffic warrant that was outstanding out of Adams County. So you personally transported him, correct? I did. Okay. Did the two of you have any, have any conversation during this trip? Uh, he asked me what he was going to be booked on, and I told him he would be booked on the traffic warrant. And he was cooperative with you, correct? Yes. And what was his demeanor? Uh, I, I guess I felt that he was somewhat nervous, but he was cooperative. He did everything that I asked him to do. And I think you noted in your report that he was polite. Does yes. that sound correct? Okay. Um, did he tell you anything else on the ride to Thornton Police Department? Not that I recall. Did he ever ask you if he could make a phone call? He did. Okay. 
Okay, and when was that? Uh, that was during the booking process, and I explained to him that uh, I needed to ask him some booking questions, and that he was free to use the phone after I asked the questions and filled out the forms. Um, and then after completing the forms and the booking process, I asked him if he wanted to use the phone, and he declined at that point. Okay. So after the booking process was over and the defendant declined to use the phone, what did you do then? I collected all of his clothing and his belongings for evidence. Did you collect his cell phone and his wallet? I did. Where did you find these items? Uh, his cell phone was in his right front pants pocket and his wallet was in his right rear pants pocket. And um, I believe that there was miscellaneous items inside of his wallet, is that correct? Correct. Okay. the witness? Yes. Mr. Thomas, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 87. Do you know what that is? Uh, it's the defendant's cell phone. And does it appear to be in substantially the same condition as the last time that you saw it? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I'd move to admit People's 87. Any objection? Your Honor, if I get out of Sure. People's 87 is received into evidence. May I approach the witness again, Your Honor? Yes. Mr. Thomas, I'm handing you what has been marked as People's Exhibit 89. Do you know what that is? Uh, the defendant's wallet. And what did you do with those items on that evening after you collected them from the defendant? I bagged them in evidence bags and logged them on an evidence sheet. And after that, what did you do with them? I was uh, instructed at that point by Sergeant Fazzetti to take the evidence back to the scene uh, to turn it over to the CSI investigator for Greeley. And did you do that? I did. If I could have one moment. No further questions, and Your Honor, I'll be admitting this last exhibit through another witness. Thank you. Cross examination. Thank you. Can I approach and get the last? Sure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Offer you, officer, you said that Mr. Andrade complied with all your commands, correct? Correct. But at some point, he was sort of moving around or reaching towards the, the bottom of the seat or something like that, is that right? Yes. And you believed that um, possibly he was searching for some kind of weapon, is that right? <clears throat> yes. Is that more out of your own safety and just cautiousness rather than you didn't actually see a weapon or anything, did you? No, in my experience as a police officer, that's, that's what I do when I see somebody reaching, I can't see their hand and they know that I'm there. Sure, so there was nothing, I guess, unique about this situation that led you to believe there was a weapon. It was just simply his movements that, that led you to believe that, is that right? I think the fact that, uh, that there was a hit on the license plate for a felony also uh, makes me a little bit more vigilant of that. Sure. sure, and to your knowledge, no weapon was found in the vehicle, is that true? I couldn't tell you, I didn't search the vehicle. Okay, so as far as you know, you, you just have no idea. I have no idea. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? No, no. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome to step down. Thank you. 
I just had a brief conversation with the parties. The next witness is going to be about two to three hours long. Um, and so we're not going to do that person today or begin that person today. And so we're going to be in recess until tomorrow. Um, I think everybody knows the plan for tomorrow to check the website or to call to find out what's happening. I anticipate we're going to get started um, tomorrow morning. Um, to give you a little bit of extra time to drive carefully, we'll get started at 8.45 tomorrow. Uh, I want to again instruct you that until the trial is completed, you must not discuss this case with anyone. That includes your family, people involved in the trial, other jurors, or someone else. I think human nature is you're going to go home and uh, your family or friends knowing that you're on the jury and that there's been some witnesses that are going to want to know what happened. And your knee-jerk reaction, I think, would be to tell them what's going on in court. You cannot do that. It's really important. If someone approaches you and tries to discuss the trial with you, please let me know about it immediately. It is also important that you must not read or listen to any news reports on the trial. That can come in many ways. That can be through some type of blogging, through Twitter or some other service, uh, through email, through the internet. There's no, there's gonna be lots of media going on in this case. It's really important that you avoid any type of contact with media that involves this case or talking to any third party. Do not in any way try to gain information about the case outside of the courtroom. That also includes no research on the internet, medical or law books, encyclopedias, or dictionaries. Finally, it is especially important that you do not form or express any opinion on the case until it is finally submitted to you, which would be after closing arguments. Does everybody understand? What I would appreciate everybody doing, and I'll, I assure you that it'll be confidential, only um, my clerks and I and the jury commissioner will have the information. If you can please provide contact information for you, and if you have more than one form of contact, for example, email, cell phone, home numbers, if you can please leave it with us just in case we need to give you updated information, okay? All right, thank you for your hard work today. We appreciate your time and your patience, and we'll see you tomorrow at 845. If everybody can please rise for the jury.